considering me and, and you know so yeah yeah so you wow, well, come on you're one of the best out there so, on your instrument definitely so thank you yeah so but uh, i will just jump in man i, I, I watched the other day like uh, a trio gig you did with eric revis and damien reed from sam yes. first yeah and you guys sounded awesome i mean it's like this is like something new brewing up or like a new trio or uh it's, it's definitely is a new plans to record. We're going to be recording in January, actually. So in a few weeks, and we have a couple of gigs in December, and it's a whole, it's a whole definitely an ongoing project that we're going to record for sure. Um, but but this particular trio happened in LA because everyone is LA based. Yeah, you know. So Eric lives in LA and has has done for a long time. Um, you know, I I moved to LA in January of 2020. So I've, yeah. I've been here a little bit, and um, you know, Damian is is my buddy from New York, um, who I've known for a long time, and we, you know, we played on and off over the over the past ten years or whatever. But he's originally from LA. Yeah. Um, and when the pandemic hit, he kind of moved back here because you know everyone's work got canceled, and he came back here to kind of like help out his parents and stuff, and you know whatever. So he's been here, and actually, they they all live like um, maybe twenty minutes down the road from where from where my wife and I live in LA. So he's always around here hanging and I see him all the time, like, you know, way more than I did in, in New York, in fact. So, and, um, so so those two guys, that's kind of my go-to trio situation here in LA. And they're both fucking amazing people and amazing musicians. Yeah, and, yeah. and the music is so easy with them and they we just dive in and like, it, it's really raw and really intense and just, it, it kind of covers everything. So like, I'm, I'm excited and it gives me, um, a, a good reason to be happy here in LA and just knowing I can go to that. And this is, it's as good as I could ever wish for no matter where I am. You know what I mean? So like, yeah, it's like one of the best rhythm sections you can get. I mean, yeah, wherever, like, I wanted to ask you, you said you moved to LA like last year, last January, January, 2020. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. What, what was the decision to move to LA? I mean, like, well, there was a few decisions really. I mean, and this was, remember, this was before the pandemic. So, exactly, like, yeah. you know, so it was kind of a blessing in disguise that, you know, we kind of preempted what was about to go down, which of course we had no idea. But, you know, I've been coming out to LA for the past decade or so, you know, just, just to visit and to hang and play. And I, I always have fun coming out here. And the scene never used to be that cool back in those days, but over the, gradually over the past decade or whatever, it's really developed into something kind of special. There's a lot of good musicians out here, like, and the, the diversity of the music is, 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 I think is way broader and there's a lot of good, good stuff mm -hmm. happening here. Um, and also we just felt like time for a change because, you know, I had been living in, in New York for like 13 years or something like that. Yeah. And I moved to New York in 2006. And, you know, I consider myself very lucky and fortunate. I got to do all this amazing stuff. Um, and then it got to a point where I really wasn't earning that much money in, you know, in the sure. city, being in New York. And, um, I had a, you know, I was touring a, not a huge amount, but like a, a fair amount, you know, with Antonio Sanchez and a couple of other people, I mean, Alcifar and, you know, uh, yeah, Benin and, and, yeah. a couple, couple of others. Yeah. And, you know, um, so it got to a point where I was like, well, if I, if we, you know, if we move to LA, I can still keep whatever touring gigs I have. And I'm not going to be sacrificing that. You know what I mean? I'm not going to be losing any of this. I'm going to keep all the good stuff that, you know, I'm going to keep all the stuff that kind of earns me my money, but I can have a nicer quality of life. You know, my wife and I, we got married in, in um, 2019. So it, it just felt like, you know, it was nice to have like a fresh start somewhere. Like I was tied in New York. Um, and I wasn't, I was playing a little bit in the city, you know, but, but yeah, you know, I know it's, it, it, it's fine. It, it just felt like a natural time for a change. So, so we did it. And, and we, um, I, I remember I was out here doing um, a few gigs in October 2019 and I kind of had the seed planted and then my wife and I came back out here over Thanksgiving 2019 just to look at apartments and then we, we 
signed the signed the lease on the place and then we I was like, oh shit, we gotta move like in, in, in a month. So like the December, Christmas time we packed up and shipped yeah, sh- shipped everything, you know, across the country, like my piano, my furniture, my, my oh, keyboard, shit, but, yeah. Yeah, no, every, everything, bed, couch, whatever. Um and then we got, you know, we moved January twenty twenty and then got settled and then March March twenty twenty everything was fucked anyway you know what yeah, I mean? so, yeah sure <laughs> and and i was you know way happier to be writing out the pandemic here than in, in being in new york you know because at least here there's space there's there's nature yeah. so so like i was spending a lot of time outside the weather's always good i was going hiking i was going to the beach and it, and it, and it really kept me sane throughout all that dark stuff because in new york i would have been inside my apartment on the fifth floor you know yeah it would have you know and then Sub taking the subway and all that stuff, you know, in the early days of the pandemic when like no one knew what was up. So, at least here, if I'm gonna yeah. nothing here, you know, and now like it's kind of opening up and I'm getting to play play again, and like you know, it's, it's cool here. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. No, it's also nice, nice to see you know, you you, you know, I always associated uh. The West Coast, like more fusion type is, you know, kind of yeah, for sure. And, I'm, I mean, that there's you know, there's a long history of like like that fusion, if you want to call it that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. And um, I like some of it. I I hate a lot of it. You know, like I, I like you know, I like I like everything. You know, and, and if, if you know anything about my music, you'll know oh, sure. oh, sure. place. You know, so like some of my shit sounds like fusion. Some of it is like avant garde with like Evan Parker and Tyshawn. Oh uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I will ask you about that, man. Yeah, definitely. yeah, right. But, but my point is that it, that I like everything. You know, I really like everything as long as it's good and it, and it's and it's got the qualities that I like. And that sometimes is is well, I don't, I don't want to say damaging, but in the past it has been damaging or confusing because I mean, not not to me, but other people like don't know what I am or what I'm doing. So. They, it kind of confuses people and you know they don't know, you know so, but whatever I, I i i don't care about that so much anymore i just try and do no it, you know? i mean I, I remember like you know you played with benny and did a lot of yeah. with him and i remember in back in 2004 i invited benny to europe we did a slovenian tour actually like on oh, my cool. se- second record and he had you know in slovenia we didn't have the uh, ipods the small thingies mm-hmm. with music and, you know, I was like, okay, let me check it out. And I checked out through his list, you know, and of music. And it was like, you know, all jazz, Coltrane, whatever. And then it was like, you know, classical Stravinsky. Then he had like Beyonce and, no, Destiny's Child and Christina Aguilera. And I was like, mm-hmm. man, what's happening, you know? And I was like, yeah, man, you know, it's good stuff. It's, I was like, yeah, shit. You know, that's like really changed my, I was like, fuck, yeah, you know, you can. Well, well it's music. Is it. Benny is very open-minded and, you know, I have a long history with Dave and, you know, he lives here in LA too, like just down yeah. the road from me, in fact, you know, so, he, he, you know, he, he also, uh, Dave is from here and he moved, he moved back here a few years before, before yeah. I moved here and, you know, so the, there's a, there's a community around here, it, it's, it's, it's nice, it's building. you know, uh, yeah. but, you know, like, I, I've been good friends with, you know, the guys from Noah, Lewis and Genevieve, you know, I, I, I knew those guys, like, way back in the day and, you know, re- basically right before their thing took off and they became you know very popular and stuff but that stuff has been brewing in la for a long time you know so yeah. that's is really cool you know there's thundercat and brain feeder and that whole scene you know um but there's a lot there's a lot of other cats like more jazz guys or east coast guys whatever you want to call them that have moved back here now so you know steve lehman is here mark turner is here like there's all, all these people oh yeah mark turner moved to uh, yeah, yeah yeah exactly uh, someone told um, me yeah um, you know, Justin Brown is out here. Damien is here. Like, it's it's a Revis is like I could go on. There's a whole fan. It's it's cool, man. You know, so I mean, it's happening. I, yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And I, I wanted to ask you this. Uh, you, you know, you mentioned all these influences. So so you growing up in the UK and uh, let's say l- late nineties in the UK. Like, how how was the you know, now we're on the West Coast, being sunny all the day, <laughs> like in the UK, all this gloomy landscape. I love the UK, by the way. You know, but it's I, just I, like, I, uh, uh, how did, how was the, your jazz development in the late nineties? Like, who were your main influences? I mean, I, I know you like, you know, you did the record with Evan Parker, who I extremely love. You know, it's he's one mm-hmm. of my heroes. But yeah, me too. especially the UK jazz scene, you know. Like, many incredible players but like how did that influence you or what were your main influences back then 
Well, the scene I think in the UK was was arguable, obviously very different back then when I when I was a kid in the in the nineties, you know. Um, but I mean, my influences back then were very strange, and it's hard to put my finger on it. You know, like no one in my family is musicians. I just kind of got into music when I was a, when I was a young child. I mean, I'm talking about in the eight, in the eighties now, you know. So like I. You know, I was born in 1984 and I started playing piano when I was like four, four years old or something. You know? oh. um, and for no particular reason, I, I, I was just into music and I asked my parents, for, you know, for piano lessons. Not, neither of them are, are musical at all. I have a history in music, but I'm very lucky that they're incredibly supportive and always, always were and, and still are, you know, very supportive in what I want to do. They, they never push me to do that stuff which is probably why I wanted to do it so much, you know? Sure. <laughs> they, they never pushed me, but they, but they were like, sure, you want to take piano lessons? Sure, there you go. And then it, it kind of took off quickly and that was it. They've just always been the most... ...parents I could ask for, you know, which is, which is amazing. So I just took piano lessons. But also back then in, in the late 80s and early 90s, like I remember like... Like um, on the TV all the time. There was like live music on on the, on the TV in the U, in the UK, which maybe I don't even know if there is anymore so as as much. But there was like you know there was like Top of the Pops, and there, I would see jazz right. musicians who I kind of knew like on there. And there was you know Jules Holland has his TV show, which is probably still going, right? Yeah, I, I think know. it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, but so there was like lo- there was like a lot of live music on the TV, just watching TV, not, not like specialist stuff. Like you would sit down on a Friday night, Saturday night, whatever. And so like live music was just very much a part of the culture so i was like okay i've seen i, I, I want to do that that's cool you know um and then also in the town that i'm from which is called doncaster which is in yorkshire in the north of england there's kind of randomly a very good like youth jazz program that the Don- doncaster youth oh, really? jazz oh. association yeah and it's kind of one of the one of the, the best ones in in the uk actually which is just happen, happens to be the time that i'm from they have a very good like um youth big band program like you know three like i think three different graded big bands and uh-huh. uh, and it, it has a good reputation in the uk yeah it's totally random i don't know why it exists there but it does and um i, I joined their program and, and started playing in, in the big bands um when i was maybe 10 years old or something. And then when I was 14 years old, I went off to a, a specialist music school called Cheatham's. I'm not sure if you know what that is. No. Um, so Cheatham's is a, a specialist music school in, in Manchester in the UK. Um, and they have kids there from the ages of eight to 18 and it's still going. It's, and it's a, like a classical music school primarily, you know? Um, and I auditioned and I got accepted there, which was, that was when she got really serious for me. I was like, okay, now I have to really, practice because you know like I, I kind of went there and I was like one of the worst players there it's like full of like you know classical geniuses and like yeah, yeah, sure. you know and you know so it but it, I was just surrounded by just talent 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 and I it was it was incredibly daunting but like really inspiring at the same time at a very formative age like you know 14 years old until I was 18 like that's the you know hormones and all this that's, shit you know yeah, that's amazing huh? um so I so I was you know again my parents supported that it was a big move um and, you know, it was, it was a boarding school because they have kids from all around the world. So you live there, you stay there, you sleep there. And, you know, I would go home like some weekends because I wasn't that far away, but it, I was too far away to, to, you know, go home every day. So, but that's when stuff got serious and I studied classical piano a bit more seriously there and, and got my stuff together. And then I kind of got more into, into jazz as opposed to like big band stuff. And then, and then that was it. Then it was, then I was 18 and I went to college in London and I came to New York and, you know. Well, wow. yeah. Uh, what was this first New York experience for you like? I mean, I know you lived there like for 13 years, but like, you know, I asked to everyone coming, maybe even for, for, for us, maybe you from England, since you've been in London before, it was not such a big transition, but still like jazz wise, I guess, this move to New York, how, how was that like for you? It was very exciting for me at the time. And I was 22 years old. And, oh. you know, when, you know, when, when you're kind of that young, you, you have less inhibitions and you know you have less responsibilities so i was just like moving there to to try it out and have fun and, and just simply to be around exciting music and musicians that that i was admiring so um and my musical tastes and and whatever have shifted a lot so like i was playing very differently back then to how i how i play now um and also, like, I mean, I considered moving to New York when I was 18 years old. I think I, or, I mean, I did audition over in New York when I was 
back then. But and I and I got some places at school, but I didn't get any scholarships. Like it was yeah, expensive, yeah. and I was like, I was I was too young, and and you know, I I got accepted to the Royal Academy of Music for free, which is like the best place in the UK. So I was like, well, this is free, and it's the and it's the best situation. So I'll do this for four years, and then go to New York when I'm 20, which is what I did when I was 22. Yeah. But in those first few years, I was playing with a couple of like New York based musicians. Like, you know, we, we played in London with like Will Vincent and Ari Honig, you know, and you know, like, and I was way into that stuff back then. And, and they're both really, really amazing. Um, and I had such a fun playing with those guys as like a 21, 22 year old. And, and they were like, you know, you should think about moving to New York. And they were encouraging me to, so they kind of encouraged me to move over and, and I, I did. Um, but of course, I you know not being American, I need I needed like a visa or a way to be there. So I was like, I guess I got to do two years at at, at um, a Manhattan school or at a master's, any master's thing, um, which is exactly what I did. And I moved there, and I and especially during those first two years of college, that's that's when things kind of really started to take off. I, I pretty rough rough time being there. Um, but I love being in New York and being immersed in that scene. And, I, and it was really happening back then. And I feel like I caught the very tail end of, of like, the, the, I don't want to say the golden era or the, all the good stuff, but I was really betting kind of at both ends. I was hanging out a lot because, you know, I wasn't getting what I wanted from college, but I, I knew all this amazing music was going on in the city. So yeah. I was hanging out late at night and I, I, I could like, you know, I could survive on three or four hours sleep in the shop at class the next morning. I, I, I could do all of that, you know, and, and I was hustling for gigs and surrounding myself with the musicians I wanted to meet. So, you know, I met Vinny early on in those days. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I met Ambrose early on in those days. Basically all the people who were on my, in my first band and on my first album, I met Taishan Sori back in those days. And I just made a beeline for the music. I was like, wow, there's all this, I, I I was like, I, I want that, I want that, I want to be a part of that, I'm, I want to play with this. I, and, and when you're young, you just have that that energy and you, I, I just did everything I could, you know? And yeah. I, I had a great I had a great time when I first moved to New York. And uh, and then it was school finished and I stuck around and then I started working and that's, that's it, you know? You, you, you mentioned Tyson, like, I, I think I invited him to one of his first tours in Europe in 2000. Oh yeah, is that, is that right? Yeah. So when, was, when would that... 2003 or 2004 mm -hmm. and we did a record and you know I, I wrote like really heavy I mean stuff you know like odd meters six mm -hmm. pages tunes and like man on the second gig he 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 didn't need the sheet music anymore oh of course yeah I mean I was just like blown away I mean like how, how was your story with Tyson I mean I know I have the record oblique I mean I love that one Oh yeah, I believe. I mean, that's that's a few years old now, but that's I mean, that's hard music, and you know. Well, Tai Sean, I mean, is uh, I mean, I, I don't like to pick and choose to say someone's better than someone else. Sure, but, I know about you. but but if I have to pick one one musician that I've encountered in my life that is the most remarkable cat, it is obviously yeah. going to be him, you know. And I've been surrounded by all kinds of genius. Oh, yeah. I've been surrounded by many many other amazing people but like he's a special one yeah he's a special one and um that was obvious from the first time i met him and the first time we played and they were the first how i met him i was playing on somebody else's recital at the new school like the bass player called me um and, and said can you play on my recital i was like sure and tasha was playing on it i knew who he was but i didn't know much about him and, and I, I didn't really know what to make out of it at first like we went and i did the rehearsal and like it was just kind of like the easiest thing in the world but it was a little intimidating at the same time because it was playing all this crazy shit but like it always worked and if i was wrong it, it just always worked and it, and it yeah. felt good and i had we had a good time playing with each other and then i i started to get my own little gigs in new york and i would i was like well i want him in my band it, it, it was just an easy choice i was like i want I want to be around that. I want to make music like that because the possibilities were endless. You know, we could take it anywhere and, and we yeah. did, you know, and I could play the craziest, hardest, most difficult stuff. I could write the most difficult stuff and I could put it in front of him and he and we'd play. And then we could improvise the whole gig with, yeah. with no music and he can do everything and anything with, with sincerity and integrity and honesty. And, it, and it's, he's not messing around. It's, so I, it was overwhelming for me and it, and it really raised the bar of what I, of, of what was possibly like kind of mentally and like, I, it just like reset my whole, my whole um, alignment of, of 
of everything. And I was like, what? I, I was like, I need to step it up because <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was like, I need to, I just need to. But um, so yeah, we started playing and then, you know, you know, we did all a whole bunch of little gigs in New York and then um, that band with Taisho and, you know, we did my master's recital at Manhattan School of Music um, in June or whatever it was of 2008. And then about two weeks later, that same band went into the studio and played all the material from my, from my master's recital, which became, consequences. Which, was my, which was consequences. You know? Oh, really? Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. But like I basically, you know, from my from my master's recital at the Manhattan School, and we, I went and played Consequences. Basically, we did the album, and, and we've been doing that music in the fifty five bar and whatever else. So we, you know, we, we've been. It was easy. We just went and did the album, and it was it was out, you know. And that was my f first album. I was like, you know, are people gonna you know, what they're gonna make of it, you know? But it was cool, and it got some attention and whatever, you know. So it was. Oh, well, you wrote great stuff, man! Like Wayne's World and that suit of suite of consequences, and that's that's beautiful. I mean, it's really challenging stuff when you listen to it. It's just like, you know, it, yeah, it's, yeah, it's burning. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but you, you know, I mentioned before also Evan. Like speaking of Tyson, since you're playing also in freak free, you know that he can improvise or he can. Or you also, of course, play the heaviest shit out there. Uh, I wanted to ask you about sound, space, and structures, like especially since you connected with Evan Parker, him being like one of the top five UK of not only UK, European mm -hmm. avant-garde jazz figures. Let's put it like that. How, yeah. how did that story with Evan begin, actually? And uh, how was it for you, like especially both of you being from the UK, like this connection? How did it work? And well, I mean, I obviously, you know, admired Evan's music and whatever for like a long, long time. And I, I didn't know him from the UK at all. We never played together when I lived there yeah. or anything like that. And I, I wasn't playing that kind of music when I lived in the UK, you know. Um, so I'm trying to think when I first contacted him. You know what? I, I'm kind of going back in my mind now. <laughs> yeah, so, sure, I know. <laughs> yeah. So I met Ty Sean and, and did those albums you know early on. And then we did Oblique and we were playing. We, so we were playing in each other's bands back then. And then we didn't play for couple of years because he went off to like to Wesleyan and stuff and, and, and was busy yeah, exactly. in, in the world of academia and stuff um but then around when was it yeah 2010 I put I guess a trio together um which we, we, with with John A. Bear and, and yeah. Tyshawn um and I remember when when I put that trio together and we went into WBGO in Newark New Jersey and did a little radio thing and we hadn't played together as a trio before oh. but like but I, and I don't think I'd play with, with, with A. Bear yet, you know, but I had, you know, we knew of each other. I certainly knew of him. And I had met him a few times. I've seen him play with Fred Hirsch and stuff. And he's you know, amazing. Yeah. yeah. yeah and like, I, I'd heard him play with Andrew Hill and stuff. You know, like Andrew Hill's one of my heroes. Yeah, I, I, well, mine too. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And like John has, it's just, it's, it's just got this sound. Like it's, it's like, a, it's like a, it's, it's just this beautiful, rich, warm sound. And, and like Ty Sean, he can play all he's, he can play lines and all this crazy shit, mm. but like it's not it's loose and it's open and it's it's just and it's elastic and it's you know, yeah. I was like, this is great, you know. So I said, Do you want to do some trio stuff? And he was into it and I was called Ty Sean. And um so I, that trio came together around 2010. And then in 2011, I was trying to book some trio gigs in Europe and I started to do that and, and I, I got a thing at the Bim House, I, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was like, you know what? I really want to play with Evan. Hmm. See if I can get him over to fly, you know, like quickly from London to Amsterdam and play. Just, just have him on this one gig at the Bim House. I'll pay for it myself, whatever, you know. Um, and I wrote him and he was into it. And, oh, wow. Um, Interesting. Uh, but then I had to cancel my own tour because I only had a couple of gigs. And, and that was the, um, 10 years ago in like October, November 2011 was the very first tour I did with Antonio Sanchez. Oh, yeah, um, sure. Right? And, um, you know, you understand, you know, like, I, I didn't have many gigs back then. I don't have many gigs now. But, 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 <laughs> I don't you know, but, you know, you know but, but back then, 10 years ago, when I was, like, 27 or whatever, and, um, you know, someone like Antonio calls me and he says, we're going on the road for five weeks. I had never been on the road for five weeks. So I was like, I have to take this, it's, you know. Um, so I, I cancelled my own gig. And I wrote wow. it. I was like, I was yeah. like, I'm sorry. I, I was like, 
you understand i got a you know it's five weeks on the road you know I, it's in it he, he was cool and um and it didn't happen then but then a couple of years later you know he would come over every so often to um curate the stone or play at the stone oh yeah you know? exactly cool. um and i saw he was coming and i think i wrote him and, and he was like, oh he's like do you want to play one of the nights of the stone with me i was like well like, yeah I'd love to, you know come on, you know and um and then i i called john and um and Taishan and we did it and it was just like the best shit ever and then i but i already booked the recording you know even though i didn't know how the gigs would go but like i was like, okay evan's in town John and Taisho are around. We're going to do a gig at the Stone, and then I just booked the time in the studio, and that was Sound Space Instructors. That was it. And oh. I think we did it in 2013. Eventually. Yeah. So, so it was like two years after the cancelled thing with Evan. You know. Yeah, it's, it's so beautiful. If if you go, you know, through your discography, you have consequences, and then you have this one, and then you have learned to live, and it's like really, you know, yeah. that, this is exactly where we come from. Like you're this. You know, it's music, which I love. You know, it's yeah, exactly. My, 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 it's exactly. Yeah. Uh, also, speaking of learn to live, I, I listened. That's your last last record that you did, and uh, so lo look, looking forward to the trio one actually. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, uh, how, how did you come up with that one? And you know, having Eric, Eric, and Justin. I mean, two both monsters on drums, you know, like speaking of monsters on drums, like uh, how did that project happen? Like, especially where, where did you get the idea to, to have them on a couple of tunes on both drummers? I mean, um, well, yeah, I mean, they're, they're both like the, the baddest drummers. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like in, in their own individual kind of worlds, it's just, you know, it's like, and and everyone, you know, when when I told people I was having both of them on some tracks, but people would laugh. It was like, oh, you mean Harlan isn't enough by himself, or just Justin's not enough? Just, just you know what I mean? I was like, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Um, all right. So I'll tell you exactly how this project happened. First of all, it was supposed to be just a regular quartet recording with Harlan and Osby and, and Matt Brewer, um, mm -hmm. because we had done. Um, a, qu a quartet gig in, in Langnau in Switzerland. Um, oh yeah, the Langnau Jazz Nights, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So I, I, I was teaching for the whole week at Langnau Jazz Nights or whatever it was. This, yeah, this was 2017 for sure, I remember, because we recorded that in 2018. Mm. So I was there for a week and I was doing the piano workshop and Osby and Matt were there doing their teaching thing for a week. And as part of my commitments there, I had to do a concert of my own music. So I was like, well, Matt and Osby are around. They're already here, like, yeah, you know. Sure. I would play with them and I needed to find a drummer and um, Harland I was writing with him and he, he was on, on tour with Charles Lloyd but he had a day off you know so he was like I, says, I can make the gig if you fly me from Rome or whatever it was I was like you'll, you'll do that on your day off he's like yeah I'll come it'll be great uh -huh. Osby, and especially because you know Osby and Harland obviously have, have a long history and they hadn't played together in quite a long time like it had been like maybe like 10 years, they've been like 10, 11 years. Something. So yeah. I was like, I was, I was excited to be in the middle of their thing, you know? Reunion, yeah. So I was like, this is so cool, you know? Um, so so we did it and the gig was amazing. And I was like, well, I need to record this when we get back to the States. Um, and I had tentative plans to do it with a record label and they were kind of messing me around and it, and it never really happened, basically. Um, um, and then, you know, go forward to February of the next year, 2018, and I had some other gigs booked at the, at the Jazz Gallery. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and around the same time, and that, that's how it was. Yes, I'm, I'm just remembering on the fly right now. But but around the same time, I, I did figure out the recording situation with another label um, for that original quartet. So I was like, guys, I, I managed to figure it out. So we're going to record in at the end of February or whatever it was, you know, the, the Harland and, and, and Osby. And ha Harland, had not only done the Langnau gig, we'd done a couple of gigs in, in New York, whatever. So like, oh, he, knew, so like he, he knew most of the music by this stage, right? So, and Matt, like we play together all the time. Yeah. And, you know, so I got the recording situated in the end. I was like, we're gonna record at the end of February. But separately to that, I had this weekend of gigs booked to the Jazz Gallery. Um, in February, which was just an, another project. It wasn't with the recording in mind because I didn't know the recording was happening yet. So I, it was just a different weekend of gigs and it was a quartet with Matt also, but with, with Nicholas and with, and with Justin mm -hmm. Brown, you know? Oh, oh so, okay. 
so I, I did I did these gigs at the gallery and I was like, well, this is great. And I said, well, I'm recording in like in, in two weeks. And we, I just did these gigs and I was like, I should have these guys on the record, but I, I, I don't want to throw the other, I, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to get rid of Osby and Holland. Not that I even wanted to, you know, yeah, sure. but, I was, but I was like, I was like, it doesn't make sense to, to leave Nicholas and Justin off of the thing if they're around and we've just done like a weekend of gigs and, and they, they know the vibe of the music and they, and they've gotten into it. So I asked the, the people who were, you know, for, for like more money for, to, to add Nicholas and Justin and they, they were like, cool. And that was it. So I was like, well, I'll just, I, I, I didn't know at the time, like who was going to play on what and also yeah, like, sure. Also, Justin was about to go on the road with Thundercats, so like, so he wasn't available for the whole three days of recording. He was only available for one of the days. So, I, so it was like really a situation of just just show up to the studio when you can, kind of thing. And if the, there was one day I remember because there was one day when everybody was in the studio at the same time. It was three one. The first day was the second set with everybody. So two oh, members, Nicholas nice and Greg. Um, beautiful. But not everyone was available for all three days. And then we did one day quad set with, um, with Nicholas. And then one day quad set with Greg. So yeah. it was like three different days of recording. And um, that was it. It just came together just like on, on the fly, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's such, such a killing. I mean, you wrote really, really amazing music. It's so diverse also. You know, what, what, what you wrote, like that Lady Steve I has like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Well, that was just that was just like a. I mean, you know, it's like a, it's just like a simple tune, and it's just yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And like I know Nicholas like thrives in those situations. Yeah. Where like he, he he likes to play with that aesthetic, but like Nicholas, you know, he can play the open shit and whatever else as well, which sure. people tend to forget. But like this, you know, like just like let's let's lay on a groove and let let Nicholas just like you know what I mean. Like it's that's just that's just as great to me, you know. Yeah, like, the, I wanted to ask you here, you know, like, when I listen to your tunes, like, I don't know, Contradictions or Global Citizen, or, you, you know, like, you, you have many times odd meters or complex structures also, and uh, then you have a space where you can blow freely in between sometimes, or, mm -hmm. like, what's your process when usually composing? Uh, how do you start? Like, like, did you know, like, you're going to compose exactly for this band or like did you know you're gonna have Nicholas or you're gonna have Eric or Justin or what's your process usually there like when composing? I mean whatever the, whatever the music I'm bringing in like I always have the musicians in in mind you know like whether I'm writing like new stuff for them or whether it's like stuff that I'm bringing in like I, I always have the musicians in mind and I really like to have like a lot of diversity within within my music as in there might be like a lot of, you know, a lot of notes or whatever, you know, like just like sheets and sheets of stuff. But then I want people to be able to like leave that alone and just like really like, you know, be themselves and like express their own voices mm -hmm. and like whatever it is, you know. So um, some of the music was already written. Um, yeah, some of the music was already written and, I, and like we had played it in Lang now and I, I kind of knew that some of this stuff is going to work, but a couple of the pieces were more brand new, hmm. and um, a couple of them were like, you know, came together in like a few days before the recording. Like the very first track, the, the opening track on, yeah. on the clip, which is just like an Alan Holes was kind of inspired, kind of, you know what I mean? Like I, I, I'm just like wishing I was Holes. Fusion is kind of yeah, yeah, you know, almost like yeah. And it's and it's, it's it's simple in its concept. It's just like triads and then like triads with a shifting thing, very. Uh, almost generic i would say which is i'm kind of talking shit about you know but like it doesn't matter to me because like it's it might it might be generic in its inception but like i know that the guys are going to make it not yeah. generic and that was the one that i wrote for two drummers i'm like this is going to be great this is like an easy tune and like it's it's the vibe of it is just like go shred you know, the, play as much drums as you can. Both of them. Did you know. tell them what to play, like Eric and Justin, or just like no, like no? I mean, I, like I, I kind of um, I, I remember that because it's one. I think it's the first thing we 
recorded as well because it's kind of easyish and i just like I, everyone gathered around the piano and i was like this is the tune and this is the form and you can hear what it is like it's not it's not that hard it's not that difficult to to conceptualize one once you hear it you, you can hear what it is so go and do it and and for you know for like a couple of minutes we were discussing oh should eric play the b section and justin play the a and yeah, yeah that's what we did and, <laughs> and, and and then we talked about that for like one minute, but then already it, it became obvious very quickly that that kind of like was bringing the vibe down and um, and people were thinking too much. I was like, you know what? I think I was like, I could just like both of you play it and just like, but they listen to each other. So it's, it's fine. Yeah. Like they, they, they were playing with each other. So it just sounds like one big drum set. Like it just sounds ridiculous. Like it's, you know, it's... But what, what, what did they say? Like, I, I don't think Eric and Justin ever played before together. I mean, it's rare. Like, yeah. how did they react after this song, the first one, when they finished? Like, I mean, because how I mean, was the I vibe? Think, like, I, I think they were just having like fun, you know, playing and recording with yeah. each other because they don't get to, to really yeah. do that with the drummers, you know. And like, I know they have big love for each other, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And obviously, Holland is a like, generation above, and you know, but so Justin looks up to him, but like. Um, the, so it was just like, it was it was it was special to be in the middle of all of that you know yeah well, definitely yeah. how are you then in this case like uh, you you know you've done a couple of records now uh, so diverse and with amazing musicians as a band leader uh, how have you grown in your eyes as a band leader if you look at consequences or like even now the the new trio you're forming with Damien and Eric like have you become more comfortable or more loose, like leading a band? You know, all these things that c come with being a band leader. How, how, how do you see that, your development? I mean, I don't know. I feel like, well, I feel like I've always been a pretty good band leader, even, even when I was young and, and inexperienced, you know? Um, and it helps that I have good bands. You yeah, know, that that kind of makes it easier. But still, you know, there's a lot of people who have good bands but get in the way of the music and they're too fussy and too picky or too neurotic or whatever, whatever it is. And yeah. well, you know, but I have never seen the point in that. I've never seen the point in hiring musicians and then kind of giving them a hard time or trying to get them to do stuff that they really don't want to do or or trying to put them in mm. a situation where they don't sound their best. You know, like whatever whatever the situation I'm hiring people for or getting people on, on gigs or albums, I want them to sound their best because it'll make me sound my best. I, like, I just can't imagine it being any other way, you know? So like, I'm going to always, always, always create an environment every single time without fail. Oh, I'm always going to create an environment where people can sound their yeah. best, you know? Yeah. Um, important. And I, you know, I learned that early on, basically, you know, probably m m more more from Binny than anybody else in terms of like yeah. leading skills and just allowing musicians to 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 be themselves and express themselves because you know Dave has a long history of lead, leading many many great bands you know um and you know he, Dave was in my first different groups you know when I when I was 22 or 23 or 24 or whatever so um so like I I learned a lot of those skills kind of from him not that he would like teach me specific things directly yeah, but just sure. just being around and seeing how he led bands by not really saying or doing that much but just hiring the right musicians and then allowing them to to be themselves this is you can't really go wrong you know yeah yeah i mean you can't and and more often than not if there was a situation or an element that was making this the 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 you know in my experience if there was a situation or an element that was making the um the, the situation bad or getting in the yeah. way that that element was was me more often than not you know like so so like i was the only problem so like and once you start to like have, have some self-awareness and, and and you know just take yourself out of the equation if, if if something is sucking or not going well it's like normally my fault so i just like take a step back and oh it's sounding good okay now i'll just try and just like have, have some self-awareness or whatever you know what i mean yeah sure yeah the, 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 you, you mentioned Dave. Uh, you know, I, I love those records, Aliza and Anakapa. I mean, yeah, especially. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm a I'm a guitarist. You know, it's Wayne and you know, on it and Adam. You know, those heroes of my generation, I guess. And but mm -hmm. uh, like, how did this story with Dave begin for you? Like, when was the first gig and or the first jam? You remember that? 
I'm trying to think. It was early on in New York. I want to say like early 2007 or something is, is when I met Dave. And um, I'm trying to think how it happened exactly. I, I met him hanging out in, in New York after, after someone's gig sometime and I knew who he was and just met. And then I was like, I want to come up to the, I'm still at school. I like, want to come up and just play. And, and, and like, luckily for me, he's open-minded enough to like play with some, some dude just, because you know, I sent I, I sent him music online, and he, he checked it out. And obviously, could, he could see I was I was decent or whatever, you know. So he came, and we played some music, and then he called me to sub in his band. Um, I think it was like March of two thousand seven, you know, um, spring break. Because I remember it was my it was my first like I was supposed to go on a spring break trip with with some college friends like to Vermont and go skiing or whatever, you know. <laughs> and, 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 I cancelled it because like Dave, it was only a little 55 buggy, but I was like, wow, was like I, I've only been in New York a few months and Dave's calling me, you know, he on his regular Tuesday night gigs subbing for either, it was either Table or Jacob Sachs, who was, it was I was like, Shit, you know, and it was Thomas Morgan and Dan Weiss and, and I, I yeah. jumped right in the middle of it and I probably did a terrible job, you know, but, um, <laughs> but, but Dave could see the potential, you know, so, so like, you know, even stuff isn't working like right away like he dave's good at seeing potential in people and luckily he saw potential in me and, and kept me around in his orbit and hired me for a few more gigs and i had him for some of my gigs and, and, we, and we we hit it off and you know i he, he was very important to me in those early days in terms of like musical guidance and and whatever else you know so yeah definitely yeah uh, i want to ask you john also about you know we mentioned uh, antonio before Mm -hmm. And you know, lines in the sand, and I guess new life that you started touring with him. Mm -hmm. uh, how was it like with touring with Antonio, and like, what did you learn from him as him being as a band leader, also, you know, and as a mm -hmm. composer? I mean, he's such a beautiful composer, also, you know, people know, and as a drummer, of course, but like, he's yeah. an amazing composer. And how was that? Like, you mentioned a five week tour, you know, you, you are from Europe, from the UK, but like, still. You know, living in New York and then coming to as a jazz musician to a European tour. How was that experience also like for you? Well, it was great. I was just on cloud nine, especially back then, because I had never done a, a, ma a major tour like that. I mean, I had come to Europe and done gigs, and I played at North Sea and then like a couple of things here and there. But five weeks, I was like, wow! I that's, was like, that's oh. long. Yeah. I was like, I made it. I was like, this is cool. You know, I was like, you know, um, and Antonio's famous, and like it's it's. It's easy for him to like put, I don't say easy, he would probably disagree, but like it is, it's, it's easier for him to put like a five week tour together than it would be for you or I, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and, um, but this was his first, I mean, he had, he had, he had done band leader gigs before, but this was a, like a new band he put together and um, it, was, it was kind of his first, ex I think it was his first extended tour of five weeks of his own thing, you know? Um, and it was, the level of it was, more professional than I had experienced in my career yet. You know, I mean, I've fortunately been around some more professional experiences since then and other situations, yeah. but I've never been in any professional situations like that where there's managers involved and I'm speaking with his manager about the flights and then oh, yeah. and, 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 and the, the travel stuff and the money and the hotels and just like it, it was, I was like, okay, so I was like, this is how it's supposed to be. Like Antonio is busy all the time like he because he was on he's, he was on the road with gary burton before that tour and he flew he came straight from another tour then he goes on to big pat like he's yeah, yeah. Like, antonio's like the most working cat ever so i was like wow you know. so like oh, he, he's too busy to deal with all of that so um yeah it was it was a new experience for me dealing dealing with the professional workings of, of a tour like that and then and then when we would be on the road it was it was interesting because um you know, Antonio has kind of probably, I would say, better gigs now than he, than he did 10 years ago, although we played some great gigs back then, you know, but it was, yeah. it was a mixture with there'd be some festivals, there'd be some concerts, there was like some, the first gig was, I, I remember this very clearly because it was bizarre, the first gig of, of the first tour with Antonio, so, so our very first thing, was a, it was a drum festival in, um, you know, in, in Poland. Oh, wow, really? Wow, okay. Yeah. Interesting. And, um, so that's the thing about Antonio being a famous drummer. He can like, you know, we can play like other things, you know, like a drum festival. But it was hilarious because I forget what the festival was called, but it was it was nothing to do with jazz. There was all these like heavy metal dudes there, and like yeah, you know, yeah, like, I mean, yeah. It was, it was it was like rock rock stuff and heavy metal and stuff. And, and Antonio was like the, the jazz guy, you know, and um, 
and like we were probably like the most tame shit you know the, mo the most like inside so we were playing like all this like new life stuff and, and all this like look, kind of pleasant sounding shit <laughs> and everybody was thinking, like what the fuck is this awesome shit you know what i mean like because because it was all like like hardcore like heavy metal and all this but it was cool so, so we were like the jazz guys you know at this drum festival and then we continued and we would play like some jazz clubs you know whatever you know probably a bunch of places you, you played around europe you know and then, and then there's some other festivals that paid a bit more, you know, so it was just yeah. a complete mixture of, 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 of everything, you know? And um, yeah, it was, it was interesting because also some of the gigs were great. Some of the gigs were, were not so great, but Antonio stepping out for the very first time as a band leader, I could, I could tell that he, and on some occasions he was like, damn, this is what it's like out here because like he's only used to, Pat Metheny, Beth, yeah, or Michael, sure. or Michael Michael Brecker, or Chick yeah. Career, and like that's I'm, I'm like, yeah, dude, you think it's like that for the rest of us? No, it ain't. This is what it's like out here, you know. So, so I was like, welcome to our world, you know. Like you're trying to do this shit on your own. That's like this, but yeah. you know, all in good, all in good humor, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. But but of course, I was very very honored to, to that he would call me for like some serious work, you know, because he could have called anyone. Like no one's coming to see me on the gigs, you know what I mean? So. For him, um, and it was, it was Benny who recommended me for the gig because Benny was in, in, the, in the band back then. Yeah. So, oh, so yeah. again, I have Dave to thank, thank for that. Um, and um, but yeah. I was kind of, I think, the out guy in the band back then, and, and it wasn't always easy at first because I was young and I wanted to play the way I played, and I was I I, I wanted to push the music as kind of as far as I could every night, maybe further than Antonio sometimes wanted. I don't want to say all the time, you know. <laughs> Um, and it, but it, so it took a minute for it to, to work out and, and form itself together. And obviously like it, it, it worked out to how Antonio wanted because he kept me in the band and he, I did all his recordings and like I yeah. was in the band for like 10 years or whatever, you know what I mean? So like it, it obviously was what he wanted, but it was interesting how we got to that point, you know? Um, and you know, as I became a little bit more mature, I was like, okay, this is not my gig. Yeah, yeah, sure. It doesn't. Yeah. It's like it. It's like it doesn't. It doesn't matter what I want, you know. Um, and um, but at the same time, Antonio obviously wants me to be myself. But how That's can I cool. serve his artistic vision while still being myself? And then you kind of like, as you mature and like you, you get to know each other personally, but best you just kind of it, it. It just kind of happens, you know. Yeah. Oh, I love that band. I mean, it's such, such beautiful music you, you guys made, you know, like... Yeah, no, I, I, I have a beautiful. lot to thank Antonio for. He took me on many nice tours all over the world and he kept me off the streets, basically, for like... <laughs> for that time. So I, I have a lot of love for Antonio. He's, he's a beautiful guy and obviously, like, obviously an amazing... Yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it was, it was, it's been a fun experience working with him. Like, it's yeah. Like show, you know? It's beautiful. Yeah. And also, like, I've, I've had him for some, some of my gigs over the years. I mean, not any recordings and stuff, but, like, he's done... Oh, really? My, like, he's, he's done a couple of my, like, gigs, like, in the 50... Not many, like, once or twice, you know, just because we, we play together. And I'm like, fuck, let's play, let's play my music. And I'm like, we're, we're not on the migration gig now. I was like, you, that's like, what? I was like, I don't care. Like, I How was that I, like? It was great. It was. I was like, it's, I was like, it's um, just do whatever you want, and because, also because it didn't matter because they weren't important gigs. I mean, every yeah, fifty five. Important. Yeah, no, no, every gig. Yeah, but I know what you mean. It's yeah, yeah. It, it's like yeah, yeah, if it's not what I expect, I'm okay with that, you know. And then some people want it to be a fit, you know, and, and that's fine. But I was like, just let's let's freak out. Let's just let's and you know and. It's fun. I mean, it's always fun with Antonio. It's, it's fun every single time, you know. And did you ever record these gigs? Do you have like bootlegs? Kind of. I mean, like, did you? Yeah, I have, I have bootlegs. Yeah. Man, c come on! <laughs> the world is waiting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Chris Potter's playing on it as well. Like, it's fun. You know, it's like Antonio and Chris, and you know, just yeah. come on, man. <laughs> I've I got that in the archives, man. Yeah. That's just for me, man. <laughs> no, no, no. But yeah, come. You, you should put that on Bandcamp or something. If those guys would, that would be maybe beautiful. Yeah, man. Maybe I'll a lot of stuff <laughs> yeah that would be beautiful to hear cool johns well thanks so much for sharing some of the i will not take more of your time so oh it's, it's cool man it's, it's been my pleasure to to talk and stuff and um thanks like for I sharing. Said, it, like it's a really cool series that, that you're doing and um and yeah thanks for um, yeah appreciate I, I, it be a part of it dude appreciate it yeah me too I mean <laughs> Oh.
Soccer Jazz. Soccer Jazz.